Welcome, this is a recorded session of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Conference of the PKI Consortium. This conference would not have been possible without our sponsors in Trust, HID Global, and PQ Shield, and the organizational support of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Working Group of the PKI Consortium, in particular in Trust, Logius, TNO, and CWI. Okay, so, welcome back everyone here in the room, glad to see so many here, and welcome back everyone online. I hope you're ready for a last or an afternoon session, which we have three very interesting uh, talks. So we're going to start with Alessandro and uh, Jelly, who will speak about investigating post-quantum cryptography building a PQC decision tree for developers, which I found was a very interesting presentation looking forward to. And uh, Alessandro is a cryptographer who has been working for TNO for the last two years, where is, he is mostly focusing on the migration to post-quantum cryptography. He has a PhD from Eindhoven University, focusing on secure cryptographic implementations in untrusted environments. Ajeli is a researcher in the crypto cryptology group at the Centrum Viskunde and Informatica, CWI, uh, nearing the completion of his PhD, congratulations, on provable security in quantum, round, quantum random oracle model. So, welcome up to the stage. Thank you, Thomas. So, I would like to start, you know, presenting a, a, a small project that we're working on, uh, which is, we, we like to call it Decision Tree. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's supposed to be a tool to develop in the choice of, uh, of uh, the new cryptographic algorithms, uh, since we're going to uh, see, you know, why is that relevant. So before getting to, you know, the, 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 the details, a small recap, usually in the series there is a small uh, two-minute recap. I'm not going to present about the whole quantum uh, quantum threat. I think, you know, it's going to come out of your ears. But, uh, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, previous efforts. Uh, you probably have already heard about the PQC Migration Handbook developed by CWI, TNO, and AVD, uh, which is as, um, a manual which targets organizations and tries to help them in the trajectory for their own migration. So the goal of the migration handbook is figuring out uh, which type of PQC personas you are, if you are an early, uh, an early adopter, adopter a, a regular adopter or a, cryptographic, uh, or a cryptographic provider. And depending on what kind of persona you are, it, should, it is supposed to help you, guide you in the, in, uh, in the preparation steps. So, uh, a few action points are identifying the vulnerable system. We were talking about making a cryptographic inventory, uh, identifying a PQC persona, and then depending on it, which, uh, which migration plan you should adopt. So that was a very first uh, appreciated step. Uh, but the, the, the focus was uh, really on the PQC persona and the migration trajectory. And there was some talk about the cryptographic algorithms, but it was a very high level overview. This is what, what is present in, in, the, in, uh, in the handbook, which is a very good overview, but it's, it, does, it is not really very informative. It's not, it's not very clear which, which algorithm you, you should use. So yeah, from the publication of the, um, of the handbook, stuff, uh, stuff happened. So we have new standard. There is XMSS, uh, stateful hash-based signatures. I also forgot to put LMS, but LMS is also, is also standardized. And you have a standard for Kyber, a standard for Dilithium, a standard for, for, uh, for Sphinx Plus. You have a new call for digital signatures. There is an additional fund, a fourth round on the, on the, on the NIST competition. Uh, there are some efforts of standardizing all the uh, other cryptographic schemes in, uh, in other uh, standardization efforts like ISO. And we shouldn't forget that Falcon will also be standardized uh, later, uh, later next year. And in all of this, there are different bodies that do recommend, uh, that do, do have, have different recommendations. The, the NIST is recommending a few algorithms, and which is not the same of, as, as the BSI and the Netherlands. And since there are no standards yet, standards yet it's very difficult to compare these two, uh, th th these, um, 
these requirements and which algorithm fits better your solution. So now we have a lot of algorithms, and so there is Kyber, there is Frodocan, there is Michaelis, and there is uh, uh, HQS, there is Bi uh, there is Bike, which are going to be uh, you know un under under uh, under review, and there is for digital signature, there is Lithium, Falcon, Sphinx Plus, XMSS, LMS, and all the other realm of, of other algorithms which are standardized. So we're trying to look at the, at the perspective of, I'm a developer, I do not really know much about cryptography, and there is a lot of choice. Uh, what, which one do I choose? Uh, what's the difference? Why should I use one instead of the other? So that is the kind of uh, problem that we try to tackle. So the, the, the goal of the decision tree a project was to first bring clarity in the, in the realm of the, of, of the PQC, you know, in the realm of, P, of post quantum crypto. And we're trying to make an overview of the, the all, all, uh, all uh, solutions that are there and trying to highlight the differences and, and the strong points. Uh, <clears throat> and once we have created the such overview, we want to create an interactive tool where, you know, you a developer can, can just submit their, their question or answer their questions depending on the kind of application you're using and in the end they're gonna get a, a, recommended, a recommended scheme. Oh wait, no, wait, no. So at, at this point we can, uh, the, the first part is done. We are working towards the, making, the, um, making the interactive part. I'm gonna talk about it later. So. What are we composed of? So there is Decipher. Uh, Decipher is a uh, Dutch uh, platform for, uh, for collaboration with uh, Dutch ministries, research institutions, and private companies on the topics of cybersecurity in general. Our topic is founded by uh, two Dutch ministries, the Ministers of Internal Affairs and Economic, uh, Economic Affairs and Climate. Uh, the research parties are TNO and CWI. And we are supported by NXP, Compumatic, and Foxit, and Technolution that are the partners that perform uh, validation of our research. And they propose uh, uh, which use cases are most relevant for them. And now I want to leave the, 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 the word to Yella, which is going to explain uh, the technical aspects of this project a little bit more in depth. Thanks, Alessandro. Uh, Yes, indeed. Uh, I'll just take you quickly to the steps that we've taken so far, uh, what we plan to do in the future, and some of the considerations that we had uh, along the way. Uh, of course, the first step, the first thing we had to do was to determine the scope of the project. So uh, actually, also for ourselves, the question was which algorithms to choose. Uh, the ones, the seven algorithms that were already shown on the slides, those are actually the one that we uh, selected to uh, include in the survey. Uh, why these? Well, uh, for the camps, uh, of course, uh, I want to say we have Kyber, which is like the, the chosen one by NIST, uh, very good all-round, uh, well-performing candidate, uh, going to be standardized. Uh, but of course, we do want some comparison material. So we also include Frodo Cam, which is like a slightly more conservative variant of Kyber, you could say. Uh, and it's also going to be standardized, uh, standardized by ISO. Uh, and then we added classic Macaulay's because uh, yeah, out of the three, this is like the most conservative option. It's also the most mature. Uh, it's been around for a long time, been very well crypt analyzed. Uh, and besides that, it, it adds some diversity also to the sele selection because it's code based, uh, um, not just not lattice based like the other two. Uh, on the digital signatures here, uh, NIST already provides us with a somewhat broader scope. Um, also, there's uh, like much more comparison work to be done here. Like, not for nothing, NIST selected uh, three different algorithms to be standardized. They each have their own pros and cons in uh, different uh, use cases. Um, <clears throat> but again, here we wanted to add one more. Uh, we added XMSS uh, because it's also uh, a very conservative and mature option. It's already been standardized. Uh, there exist formally verified implementations, and we believe that there may be use cases where XMSS can be a very good option uh, as well. 
Uh, okay, so once we selected the algorithms to investigate, uh, what did we do? Uh, as Alessandro explained, we set out to make this characteristic matrix, which in a way is very similar actually to the matrix that uh, Alessandro showed at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, it's just much, much more fine-grained. Uh, we determined a couple of uh, uh, characteristics, first on the implementation side, so uh, things like computational complexity, uh, memory usage, uh, and we just collected the data, <coughs> filled it in. Uh, as you can see, we do it separately for all the different variants of the schemes, uh, the different parameter, par parameter, <laughs> oh, can't pronounce that, <laughs> parametrizations. Uh, and we also uh, included RSA and ECC, the non-post-quantum schemes, just for comparison. Some more uh, implementation characteristics, uh, maturity in terms of like how far is the standardization process, uh, do there exist, uh, what kind of reference implementations are out there, is there any existing hardware integration, uh, how about hardware acceleration. Uh, that's all included for each of the seven uh, schemes. Uh, then when we move to the uh, security side of things, uh, it gets a bit more complicated. Uh, because yes, how do you want to compare the security of these different schemes? Of course, there is like the, the obvious way to look at the bit level security of each of these schemes. Uh, that is a, a, a measure of how much effort an attacker uh, has to put in in order to break these schemes using known attacks. Uh, that's a simple number, so yes, that's nice, that's easy to compare. Uh, but of course, there's also the unknown. <laughs> so uh, we also wanted to include um, a more qualitative uh, analysis. Um, yeah, here I have to say, you, you do quickly run into a lot of subtleties. Here's just uh, one example, uh, the analysis of Falcon, where can I point? Where we write, for example, that uh, indeed the entry problem, which is what Falcon is based on, has been studied for a long time. Yes, this is the case. Uh, but if you look closer, then actually the, the thing that's been very well studied is differently par parameterized compared to what Falcon actually uses. <coughs> Uh, so we have some s some points of critique. Uh, I have to emphasize, like, in no way do we want to cast any doubt on the security of Falcom or, or any of the other schemes. I mean, we, we, we trust NIST and we trust the scientific community that these schemes have all been uh, very well analyzed. Uh, it's just that, like, in the end for our decision tree, when, uh, suppose we recommend to you, like, for your use case, Falcon is a very good candidate. Uh, then we just want to point out like, okay, if you want a, a deep diver into the security guarantees of this scheme, then here is a, like a succinct analysis that we can provide you with. Um, <clears throat> right, so a bit more on security. Uh, we included uh, cryptographic security properties that these schemes satisfy, uh, whether there is uh, also a Security reduction uh, related to that. Um, is such a security reduction formally verified? Here in Falcon, this is actually not the case. Sorry, I, I didn't choose this example to bash on Falcon. We, we think it's a, it's a really good algorithm for specific use cases, but uh, yeah, there are some some downsides as well that we, that we feel responsible for highlighting. Uh, also on, this, on the aspect of side channel attacks. Uh, here Falcon is like not the ideal scheme if you wanna, uh, if, if you're working in a environment that is prone to side channel attacks because it's very hard to, uh, to implement the usual mitigation techniques. Uh, so it doesn't mean that Falcon is a bad algorithm, it just means that uh, we're likely not going, going to recommend Falcon to you if your application is vulnerable to side channel attacks. Uh, okay, so that's uh, the, the, what we've done so far, creating these characteristic matrix. Uh, a few thoughts uh, on them. Uh, some question that you can ask, like for example, are we now just redoing 
missed job. Like, in other words, haven't all these schemes already been thoroughly analyzed? Uh, and the answer is yes, of course. Like, we are only summarizing uh, everything that's already out there. Uh, but the point is that we want to like uh, <coughs> uh, get a good overview of all the pros and cons, and most importantly, link them to specific use cases so that we can uh, make good recommendations uh, to each of the different uh, user profiles. Um, then thinking about our target audience, maybe these characteristic matrices, they look a bit technical. Uh, just, oh no, going back, I wanted to say, yeah. But going back, maybe talking about this strong existential unforgeability or QROM, ROM, uh, that's not the, something that any developer can work with. Uh, but yeah, uh, <coughs> to remind you, these matrices are more like the supplementary material. The, the main goal of the project is to establish this uh, decision tree. And then at like the end of, uh, of the recommendation, we want to pro provide some background information. <laughs> Uh, so if you're, if you're a developer and you're also technically inclined, then you can sort of see the, the reasoning behind uh, the, the recommendation. Um, <clears throat> something we were struggling with a bit is this quantitative versus qualitative analysis, which I already hinted at. Um, indeed, like we feel that there are so many nuances that we want to do this qualitative analysis, but in the end, uh, we have to make a comparison, uh, and we have to like uh, <coughs> yeah, sort of award points for all the different characteristics. Uh, so to do that, we made another, well, you could say like summary of the summary matrix. Um, maybe you could say like, okay, now we're really back to that <laughs> to that matrix that we started with. Uh, <coughs> but again, this is just a, like a a tool that will be used to determine the path of the decision tree. Uh, on that decision tree, some of the things we thought about, uh, like, yeah, the, so the, the main objective for us, like, how do we link these characteristics to specific use cases? And this is, in fact, where our partnership with these uh, parties from industry really comes in hand in handy, because they are the, like, the, the people working in practice, so they can provide us with the uh, with the experience of what is relevant in in, with, in what case. So this Thursday we have another workshop where we are going to discuss such things with the with the partners. Uh, then a uh, uh, somewhat didactic uh, challenge is like how do we get to a minimal set of questions uh, to determine uh, uh, quickly the, the the specific context, the use case of uh, the people using our tool. Um, <clears throat> are we going to make it uh, a static tree, like so sort of this the example that was shown on the slide, the type of decision tree that you find in a magazine, or do we make it an interactive tool where the next question then can depend on the answer of the previous? Of course, that would be the coolest. I mean, we have to see <laughs> how much budget we have uh, to, <laughs> to, make it, uh, to make it happen. Uh, but that will certainly be our goal. Um, <clears throat> is it going to be just one single recommendation? Do we keep it simple? Or like like all the Dutch people in the audience will know uh, in the coming weeks there's an election and there's something called the Kies Compass that you can use to get recommendations <laughs> on what, what to vote on for a political party. Uh, there, um, yeah, you, you end up with a ranking and you can like uh, even see, because you set this to this question, we think that this is a good fit, but this might also be good. Uh, yeah, that, that's sort of the, the questions that we are working on uh, right now, how to, uh, how to fill in the details on uh, these kind of questions. Uh, just an example of how that might look. Uh, here one possible question is, are you required to use standardized algorithms? I mean, this might be some kind of compliance or uh, insurance uh, kind of thing that you're required only to use standardized algorithms. Well, then we have these options and we can make sort of the obvious 
scoring for each of the schemes, uh, which will in the end then uh, provide you with a, a best score for one scheme, hopefully. Uh, that's where we are now, so to be continued. Uh, I give the word back to Alessandro. Uh, no, we had one more slide, right? Where is it? <laughs> it fell off. So it was mo mostly a, a slide to recap the status of the, or you know, a few closing uh, closing lines on the project. The project the, we hope the decision tree will be available uh, by February next year. We are planning to put everything uh, online, uh, both the decision tree and the characteristic matrix uh, the, for w on which we base our an our analysis. And we really would like to ask for feedback on the usability and um, and, uh, and and the uh, and the understandability of this of this tool. So, if you feel like uh, int already moving to you know pushing your company to move to uh, post quantum cryptography, you plan to use the the decision tree. Uh, please test it and and come back at us for if you have feedbacks or recommendations. Uh, yeah, uh, there was also my contact, but you can hit me up uh, uh, later or for the people online. I can uh, I can find a way to to get in contact. But but that's all. Thank you. If you have feedback on question, please feel free to, to voice them. Thank you very much. This was, in my opinion, a quite uh, interesting and uh, also novel approach with the decision tree. I haven't seen that before, actually. I really like it. So to warm up here, I had a question, I think you almost answered one already. So you're running tests kind of of your decision tree against uh, your technology partners. Is that how it, uh, how it works? So we're m taking most of it from literature. We, uh, we do use validations with our partners and, and ask them, hey, this is, this is what we found. Do you agree with this? Because coming from our analysis, this is the result. And we, we are not trying to reinvent the wheel, but we're trying to really face, is this an applicable, an applicable scenario where, this, where the Kyber might work instead of, of fraud, or why would I use, need to use fraud on this? And we're really trying to get the discussion interactive, figuring out which, what is really the best fit. But we are not reinventing the wheel. We do not run tests in, in our environments. Uh, that's too much. Do we have any questions online? Oh, so we have a question. Julio, yeah, you can step up to the microphone here so we get everything recorded. Very interesting presentation. Um, just wondering uh, why a decision tree, uh, without knowing the details, and how are you developing that, that work, uh, does it make sense maybe uh, instead of a decision tree, an inference engine? You, you can ask. I, I, I just wondering, like, oh, oh, how exactly would the inference engine look like or work? Oh, well, uh, well, it's a different way. So the decision tree is basically basically a tree, and depending on what branch that you're getting, the value you are moving to uh, to next values, right? But sometimes inference engines are more like matrix that, based on uh, answers that we already know or answers that we don't know. Uh, maybe the solution is going to be different, and you don't need to cross, you know, all the branches uh, until you get uh, one solution or one answer. In that case, what is the best uh, algorithm you're going to need for for your uh, target? Yeah. So the, one of the approaches that we discussed was actually make it a sort of questionnaire. Say, okay, this is a question. These are a list of possible solutions, and depending on uh, the question that you provided gives a score to a certain a certain scheme, and at the end of the entire questionnaire, you do get the best the, the, the answer depending on which algorithm has the best score. But which is something which is more in we, we already call the decision tree, but it was it is can be more of a a, a questionnaire, a PQC questionnaire in that sense. We are still we are still developing and trying to figure out which one is the best solution, but it's not 
setting stone is going to be a, a, a tree that you have to follow. Go ahead, Jan. One question, do you also include uh, regula uh, reg regulation uh, in your uh, questionnaire? Because sometimes for a certain application you need to follow some regulation which are different depending on uh, yeah, the field <laughs> or usage. Short answer is yes, but we also want to give the possibility of, of choosing the... So one thing they did not mention, and this is mostly aimed at early, uh, early and uh, urgent adopters, and in case they cannot really wait for standards, they need to be able to choose the, so the most secure solution. So there is a pos uh, uh, the possibility of choosing, you know, do you need to follow regulation, do you want to follow regulations, but you ca in case you can't and you have to act as soon as possible, we want to also provide uh, with the solution that does not follow regulation but still fits the use case. Understand because because we, are, we have time, I, I just wanted to congratulate you because I think this, this is the kind of work that we start Maybe, you know, so in, in different conferences we've had very, you know, very deep work around, around cryptography and all that stuff, but, uh, but all this work that simplify adoption in the companies, because in the end, the people who are going to adopt post-quantum cryptography do not know anything about cryptography at all. So, so this kind of ways to simplify things are, are invaluable. So as of today, people working in companies do not know much, but they do not need to take many decisions. So it's ECC, and basically they just click next, next, finish. And but now they are going the, the decision making process is going to have an impact, and so you're going to help there. And on one of your questions um, about whether you, whether you are doing NIST's job. Maybe you are doing it, but that's also necessary because um, we we trust that the NIST process is being quite open. But uh, we are talking about cryptography, we are talking about security, and third-party verification should always exist. And, and and no no one able to do that verification should stay silent. So congratulations and. And count on me if you want to have any feedback on. I, I, I would really like to to provide feedback before you publish. That's it. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, so we had uh, one question online: is where you will be able to find the the results? Do you know, or is it uh, you said it's going to be released in February? Um, Still under discussion, it will probably be uh, under, uh, you know, uh, on a TNO domain, uh, but we, we, we will broadcast it, we'll try to make it uh, as a, you know, we, we'll try to make a lot of publicity to it anyway. But I also thought that this is something which is actually fitable for the domain of the TTI consortium, so we maintain some, like the post-condom cryptography compatibility matrix and something like this would also be very nice to be promoted by the PTI consortium. So we would, uh, the PTI consortium, I think, would like to, to stay in the loop. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, so thank you, Alessandro and Jelly. A round of applause. In today's complex, fast-paced world, you need a partner who can help secure your digital transformation so you can drive your business forward confidently. Someone who can fine-tune and integrate the secure technologies that enable mobile identities, digital payments, and a hybrid workforce. You need a partner who will have your back so you can stay focused on the road ahead and accelerate your organization's growth. Entrust, securing a world in motion.